The world is a scary place with some pretty creepy people. These individuals have done unspeakable things and ended a lot of lives until they eventually got caught up by the law. While I used to think that prison is where crime ends, sometimes it is the place where some begin and can be a death trap for unsuspecting inmates. In this video, we will take a look at the world's most dangerous man held in captivity. Jason Barnum. Nicknamed the Eyeball, Jason Barnum is considered one of the most dangerous inmates in the world. His face alone is enough to send shivers down your spine. Barnum tattooed his right eye black and inked an eyeball on his forehead, giving him this scary look. He inked his face with skulls and skeletons and his lips with skeletal teeth. Barnum has an impressive criminal history, dating as far back as 1993 when he was just 17 years old. This means the Eyeball Man had dabbled in the world of crime from a tender age. Court records also showed that he had been on the wrong side of the law with Bird charges in 1994, 2000, and 2005. He was no stranger to the four walls of prisons as he just got out of jail in 2010. In 2012, just two years after he was released from prison, Barnum made the news after shooting officers at a motel in Alaska. Before the face-off with the cops, Barnum was involved in a string of burglaries in Alaska. He steals cars and breaks into people's homes while they are around. It is believed that he used the proceeds from these burglaries to feed his heroin addiction. On that fateful day, Barnum was at the Merrill Field Inn when some police officers noticed a vehicle linked to recent burglaries. They entered Barnum's room, who welcomed them with bullets from the bathroom where he was hiding. The deputies returned fire and hit Barnum in his right arm, which he survived. On the other hand, Barnum also managed to hit one of the deputies, but the bullet slipped down the deputy's vest. The deputy reportedly resumed back to work some days later, after taking some stitches. Authorities believe that Barnum was intoxicated during the time of the shooting. Barnum was arrested and charged with attempted murder, first-degree burglary, and third-degree weapon misconduct during one of his court hearings he acknowledged that his dangerous lifestyle led him into the world of crimes. While facing the Anchorage Superior Court, the eyeball man admitted to vehicle theft, burglary, and attempted murder. He was sentenced to 22 years imprisonment. Joaquin El Chapo Guzman Joaquin Guzman, popularly known as El Chapo, is the former leader of the Sinaloa Cartel, a crime syndicate considered to be the largest and most powerful drug trafficking organization in the world by the United States. His ability to simultaneously bribe high-ranking public officials, strategically attack rival gangs, and creative ways to push his drugs into the market made him a legend in the crime world. El Chapo's tenure as the leader of the Sinaloa Cartel gave birth to the new age of the cartel. Sinaloa dominated the world of cocaine and became a major player in the heroin market under his leadership. Before he was apprehended in February 2016, the Sinaloa leader was one of the world's most wanted men. He was also considered one of the world's biggest drug traffickers. He dominated the global cocaine market and became a major distributor of various drugs, including heroin, methamphetamine, and marijuana. As a result, El Chapo amassed a lot of fortune and even earned a spot on Forbes' 2009 list of billionaires. Although the illicit funds were laundered using some sophisticated money laundering system, that was how he was able to get the recognition. Before his sentencing in 2019, Chapo Guzman had escaped a number of Mexican prisons, including two supermax prisons. In 2001, El Chapo escaped the Puente Grande, a maximum security prison in Mexico, in a cart filled with dirty clothes. According to reports, El Chapo converted Damaso Lopez, a high-ranking prison official, to his associate. It is believed that Lopez, who later worked for the Sinaloa cartel over the next 15 years, helped facilitate Chapo Guzman's escape. El Chapo was rearrested in 2014 and incarcerated at the Altiplano prison. A year later, El Chapo escaped from his cell in a tunnel where he met with a driver and a motorcycle waiting for him. El Chapo's prison escape tales came to an end when he was arrested in 2016 and extradited to the US in 2017 for drug trafficking charges. A federal court in Brooklyn convicted the drug kingpin of drug trafficking and sentenced him to life imprisonment. He is locked up for life at a supermax prison in Colorado, known as ADX Florence. The facility is considered the country's most secure prison, and no one has been able to break out of the jail since it opened in 19. 1994. Guzman is kept in isolation at the Supermax prison, has no access to sunlight, and stays alone for 23 hours a day. David Berkowitz David Berkowitz, better known as Son of Sam, is a notorious serial killer who terrorized the city of New York in the 90s. Berkowitz ventured into the world of crime in the mid-1970s and carried out his first murder using a knife before he upgraded to ending the lives of his victims with a handgun. Berkowitz once served in the US Army and was honorably discharged before he went rogue and began to commit violent crimes. Son of Sam targeted young women during his lengthy killing spree, which affected female residents of communities like the Bronx, 
Brooklyn and Queens. He also had a preference for white women with long dark hair. However, aside from his attraction to white women with long dark hair, there was a pattern in his killing spree. The majority of his victims were killed while they sat next to their boyfriends in parked cars. According to reports, Berkowitz enjoyed this activity and would even return to the crime scenes. He eluded what happened to be the biggest police manhunt in New York and even occasionally dropped letters to taunt the police and promise more murders. To identify the mysterious serial killer, the police tracked down every legal owner of a 44 caliber bulldog revolver and even set traps by pretending to be couples in parks, hoping he would show up. In July 1977, Berkowitz shot two female friends who were discussing their evening at a nightclub. Unlike his previous murders, the victims did not have long or dark hair and were not a couple. Many people witnessed the scene and saw Berkowitz as he walked away from the scene. The witnesses gave his description to the police who rather pegged him as a witness and not a suspect. A month later, the police searched his car where they found a rifle, a duffel bag with ammunition, maps of the crime scenes, and a letter from Son of Sam, which was yet to be posted. However, they couldn't enter his home to arrest him yet. They waited to get a warrant before barging into his apartment, so the evidence they recovered could be admitted in court. When he eventually got arrested, the criminal allegedly told the police, well, you got me. How come it took you so long? Thomas Silverstein. Thomas Silverstein is often regarded as America's most dangerous prisoner. This is because he killed two inmates and at least one prison guard in just six years after he was sentenced to jail for armed robbery. Silverstein went into the world of violent crime very early, and by the age of 19, he was already at the San Quentin prison in California, serving time for armed robbery. He was released on parole four years later, only to get arrested again, but this time, he was arrested alongside his father and cousin for executing three armed robberies. In 1977, a court sentenced him to 15 years behind bars at the United States Penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kankus. While at the correction facility, Silverstein became a member of the Aryan Brotherhood Gang, an organized crime syndicate with over 15,000 members in and outside prisons in the United States. According to reports, Silverstein murdered Danny Atwell, a fellow inmate, because he refused to have a part in smuggling heroin through the prison for the gang. Silverstein was convicted for Danny's death and sentenced to life at the United States Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. At the time, Marion Prison was considered a high-security facility. A court later overruled the rulings. During his days at Marion, Silverstein murdered another inmate, Raymond Cadillac Smith, who belonged to the DC Black Prison Gang. As a result, he was given another life sentence. In 1983, while serving a life sentence for murdering an inmate, Silverstein killed a correctional officer, Merle Klutz. After leaving the shower, Silverstein managed to fall in line with Randy Gomez, a fellow member of the Aryan Brotherhood Gang. Gomez unlocked Silverstein's cuffs using a homemade key and passed him a prison knife, which he used to stab the correctional officer 20 times. After the murder of Klutz, he was placed on a no-contact order where he was put in solitary confinement. Silverstein's series of murders in prisons across the US influenced the design of ADX Florence Supermax Prison, where he was housed until he died in 2019 after spending 36 years in solitary confinement. Michael Campbell Michael Campbell is often called the world's scariest criminal, an alias he got all thanks to his sinister full head tattoos. Campbell inked a pentagram on his forehead, Celtic knots on his cheeks, and a pit bull down his throat which gave him a terrifying look. He is considered a danger to women and children, since he has quite a record of assaulting women and children, especially females. As a result, he is required by the law to not hang around areas where kids might be playing. Campbell even got in trouble and got arrested in 2011 as he was spotted staying within 500 feet of a playground. Campbell was First, convicted of sexual assault in 1995 for an incident that took place in Denver, Colorado. He was accused of trying to do unspeakable things to a 14-year-old girl. At the time, Campbell was just 20 years of age. He grew up to be a regular offender. In 2021, Campbell made the news again after attempting to force his way into a woman while she slept beside her boyfriend in Missouri. According to the victim's account, Campbell pulled down the lady's underwear as she slept beside her man. Eventually, the boyfriend woke up in time and chased him out of the property. Campbell reportedly fled the property on a bike. There were also reports of Campbell attacking neighbors with machetes and axes. A neighbor once confronted him for throwing garbage and other items from his house to the streets, but Campbell responded by striking the neighbor with a shovel and punching him. That same evening, a victim called the police and Campbell attacked him with a metal bar. Campbell is currently at the Green County Jail and he is looking to get his sentence reduced. Ed Kemper when I see a pretty girl walking down the street, I think two things. One part of me wants to take her home, be real nice, and treat her right. The other part wonders what her head would look like on a stick. These are the words of Edmund Kemper, an American serial killer who operated in the early 1970s and was responsible for a string of murders during the period. Ed Kemper started his serial killing as early as the age of 15, and his first two victims were his paternal grandparents. Ed Kemper was sent to stay with his grandparents at their ranch in Northfolk, California. According to reports, he was often bullied by his classmates, 
and struggled to get along with his grandmother. On August 27th, 1964, Kemper shot his grandmother with a gun they got him during the last Christmas. While some believe the murder was the aftermath of an argument he had with his grandmother, others claim that he shot her to know how it felt. Kemper knew his grandfather may not be able to bear the pain of losing his wife, so he did him the favor of shooting the old man as he came home from grocery shopping. Once he was done with the murders, he called his mum and the local police to report his actions. Eventually, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and was kept in a mental institution for criminals. On his 21st birthday, he was released, although several psychologists protested against this move. Kemper got involved in a motorcycle accident and got a settlement of $15,000, which he used part of the money to buy a yellow Ford Galaxy, handcuffs, knives, plastic bags, and so on. Kemper murdered eight people between May 1972 and April 1973, all women. According to reports, he committed many of these murders after having an argument with his mother. On April 19th, 1973, Kemper used a claw hammer to bludgeon his mother to death while she slept after coming from a party. He spent the next few hours dismembering her body, tossing darts at the mutilated body, and disposing of her vocal cords. After murdering his mother, he hid her body in a closet and went to a bar to drink. But that was not enough to satisfy his homicidal needs. He invited his mum's friend Sally over that night for dinner, where he strangled her to death. The co-ed killer is now being incarcerated at the California Medical Facility, a state prison medical facility in Vacaville. Jose Edward Ferreira Jr. In 1982, Jose Ferreira murdered Carrie Ann Jopek, a 13-year-old who attended a party with other kids who had skipped school. Carrie was sent away from school on that day for walking the halls without a pass. The school authorities called Carrie's mother to pick her up from the school, but she refused the option since they lived a block away. Carrie's mother searched for her missing daughter around the neighborhood, including the house where her body was later discovered, but couldn't find any trace of Carrie. Nearly a year and a half after the incident, Carrie's remains were discovered by a carpenter who was repairing an old deck. Ferreira was considered a suspect when the incident happened, but wasn't charged. In 2015, Ferreira confessed to his wife about the murder he committed when he was 16 years old. Ferreira's wife reported to the West Milwaukee police that her husband had just confessed to killing and burying a girl 33 years ago. On that same day, Ferreira reached out to a crisis counselor and a TV station. According to Ferreira's account, Carrie mistakenly fell off a stair and he had his way with her before discovering that she was gone. He narrated that the two linked up during the party and went to the basement where he thought they could make out, but Carrie was not willing to do that. Ferreira pushed Carrie and watched as she tumbled down the stairs. When he discovered that she was no longer breathing, he spent about 45 minutes digging a hole in which he buried the poor girl. When the police questioned him regarding the murder, he religiously followed his brother's advice, who warned him not to admit to the crime. A day after the TV station confession, Ferreira was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. Investigators added that Ferreira had underlying felonies at the time of the confession. In March 2017, Ferreira was sentenced to seven years behind bars exactly 35 years and one day after Carrie's disappearance. Joseph James D'Angelo better known as the Golden State Killer. Joseph D'Angelo is an American serial killer and burglar who was reportedly responsible for about 120 burglaries across California between 1974 and 1986. D'Angelo committed at least 14 murders and forcefully had his way with 51 ladies. He was responsible for three different crime sprees throughout California, earning a nickname for each from the press. It was later everyone discovered that the Visalia Ransacker, the East Area Rapist, EAR, and the original Night Stalker was the same person. D'Angelo. During his stay in the San Joaquin Valley, D'Angelo was known as the Vesalia Ransacker, a thief who breaks into single-family homes, ignores valuable items, and steals petty possessions. D'Angelo would break into homes, scatter possessions, scatter women's clothes, and steal low-value items, ignoring heavy banknotes and expensive items. After ransacking a house, he would drop warning items, such as dishes or bottles, against door handles. During the period, D'Angelo murdered Claude Snelling, a journalism professor, in an attempt to kidnap his 16-year-old daughter, Beth Snelling. His last known crime as the Vizalia Ransacker was trying to shoot a local detective, William McGowan, who caught him prowling. D'Angelo later moved down to Southern California, where he was tagged original Night Stalker. On December 30th, 1979, D'Angelo murdered Dr. Robert Offerman and Deborah Manning after tying them up. It is believed that D'Angelo killed Dr. Robert, who probably tried to attack him after he managed to take off the ropes. The following year, Lyman and Charlene Smith were found dead in their Ventura home. D'Angelo reportedly used a fireplace log to 
to bludgeon them to death. At the end of his killing spree, the original Night Stalker was linked to 14 murders and went silent in 1991. In 2001, a decade later, the police made an important discovery. They figured that the DNA of the original Night Stalker and the EAR belonged to the same person. On the 25th of April 2018, D'Angelo was finally arrested and charged to court to answer for his crimes. This was 32 years after his retirement. He had married, raised a family, and even had a grandchild. To avoid the death penalty, D'Angelo pleaded guilty to 13 murders and kidnappings. He was given 12 life imprisonments with no possibility of parole. D'Angelo remains the most prolific serial offender in the history of California. Paul Bernardo Paul Bernardo Kenneth is a Canadian serial killer and rapist. He married Carla Leanne Homolka, who was known as the Witch of Ontario. The two seemed to share similar dark desires and were a perfect fit. The couple once recorded themselves as they forced three teenage girls to have intimacy with them. They eventually killed the three teenage girls once they were done. Paul Bernardo was a product of a failed marriage and almost lost it when his mother broke the news to him that Kenneth Bernardo, who he thought was his biological father, wasn't but her favorite longtime suitor. The authorities launched a manhunt in 1988 to apprehend the serial rapist called Scarborough Rapist, but they couldn't achieve much, even though they had access to a lot of information. They released a sketch of Bernardo and got so many tips from the public that they couldn't follow all of them up. In November 1990, two detectives took Bernardo's saliva, blood, and hair samples. That same year, Bernardo attempted to have his way with Himolka's 15-year-old sister, Tammy Homolka. Homolka agreed and even helped Bernardo hatch the plan by trying to lace her sister's meal with drugs. She even ensured that her sister remained a virgin till the time since Bernardo preferred virgins. After fulfilling their fantasy with Tammy, she gave up the ghost due to the chemicals used to put her to sleep. Her death was ruled accidental and no one suspected foul play. In December 1992, Bernardo beat his wife, Homolka, with a flashlight which left multiple bruises on her body. She later resumed work and lied to her co-workers that she got involved in an accident. Her co-workers didn't buy the story and called her parents, who forced her to file charges against Bernardo. During Bernardo's brief arrest, the police tested his samples, which showed that he was the Scarborough rapist. Bernardo was sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Surinder Kohli Surinder Kohli was the face behind the sudden disappearance. Of children in the village of Nithari, just on the outskirts of Noida, India, between 2004 and 2006, the alarming cases of missing children were greatly ignored by local authorities who paid little or no attention to the call for help by grieving parents. In 2006, two Nithari villagers claimed they knew where the dead bodies of two girls who were missing could be found. According to reports, the two residents had daughters who were missing, and they suspected Surinder Kohli, a domestic help for a rich and politically connected Punjabi businessman Morinda Singh Panda was behind their disappearance. That same day, three residents searched the tank drain where the witnesses claimed the remains were buried. To everyone's surprise, a resident came across a decomposed hand and called the authorities. By the time they arrived, the residents had discovered three partial skeletons from the drain tank. It was only a matter of time before parents stormed Nithari with pictures of their missing children. The police eventually took control of the crime scene and recovered the remaining bodies. Some residents claimed that the police took the credit credit for recovering some bodies, even though they were the ones who did the work. The case soon caught the attention of the media as there were claims that the police were corrupt since Panda was a rich man and was well connected. On the 29th of December 2009, Panda and his domestic help Surinder Kohli were arrested in connection to what the media called the Nithari killings. Upon further investigation of the crime scene, the authorities recovered more bodies. It is believed that Kohli's victims numbered up to 19. The court ruled that Randa had nothing to do with the murders, however, he was given seven years behind bars for soliciting sex workers. Surinder Kohli, on the other hand, was found guilty of 13 murders and was awarded the death penalty. Terry L. Nichols Terry Nichols holds the record for one of the prisoners with the longest prison sentences ever. The former U.S. Army veteran was awarded 161 life sentences and 50,000 years behind bars for his role in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. While serving in the U.S. Army in the late 80s, Nichols met Timothy McVeigh, who would later become his co-conspirator in what happened to be the deadliest act of homegrown terrorism in U.S. history. Nichols resigned from the Army after he failed to make the grades in Special Forces. The duo soon became anti-government, believed strongly in conspiracy theories and began to learn how to make a bomb in gun shows. On the 19th of April, 1995, Terry and his co-conspirators destroyed the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. They were able to destroy one-third of the building. The bombing left 168 people dead, including 19 young kids and babies. By the time the bomb went off, Nichols was already at home. However, not being on the scene didn't stop the authorities from putting him on the list of suspects. Nichols turned himself in when he realized he was wanted for questioning. He agreed that his house 
house be searched. While the authorities searched his house, they discovered blasting caps, detonating cords, and fragments found at the site, all of which linked him to the Oklahoma bombing. Nichols' co-conspirator, Timothy McVeigh, who executed the bombing, was executed by lethal injection in 2001. Nichols, however, was lucky to avoid the death penalty as the jury couldn't agree on whether he should receive capital punishment or not. In 2004, he was convicted of the murders of 161 victims and given a life sentence for each. Nichols is now housed at the ADX Florence Supermax prison in Colorado, where he spends 23 hours daily in solitary confinement. He now shares a home with other dangerous prisoners like El Chapo Guzman and Thomas Silverstein. Dennis Rader Dennis Rader is an American serial killer who terrorized Wichita and Park City, Kansas in the 90s. It is believed that Rader was involved in the murder of at least 10 people in the region between 1974 and 1991. He occasionally killed men or children. Most of his victims were women. He gave himself the name BTK, which means bind, torture, and kill, a name that depicts how he ends the lives of his victims. The majority of Rader's victims were found bound, sometimes with objects he picked from their homes. There were also marks that showed that they were strangled. When Raider doesn't strangle his victims, he suffocates them to death using a plastic bag. This modus operandi explains the word torture in his nickname. BTK lived a double life. He was a family man in the day and a beast at night. Like some serial killers do, Raider keeps personal items from his female victims to serve as trophies. This may include personal belongings like underwear and licenses and was not caught by the police. To rub it on their faces, Raider would send letters to local news outlets, taking responsibility for the killings and giving them a well-detailed description of how he committed the murder. He was only known by his moniker, BTK. In 1978, Raider sent a poem to a local news outlet taking responsibility for the murder of Shirley Vian, a woman he strangled to death a year before after locking her children in the bathroom. In some of his letters, he referenced notorious serial killers like Ted Bundy and David Berkowitz, better known as Son of Sam. BTK went silent for 13 years and focused on work and family. However, when he saw that news platforms marked the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders, one of his handiworks, he was moved to write several letters about his crimes. The letter included a computer disk that led the police to his church. The men in blue sealed the case when they got the DNA from Radar's daughter and arrested him in 2005. On August 18th, 2005, the BTK killer was sentenced to 10 life sentences. He's being incarcerated at the El Dorado Correctional Facility, a maximum security prison in Kansas, the same state he terrorized. In 2023, 18 years after his sentencing, Radar made the news after a revelation that the serial killer is now linked to five new murders. Abduwali Muse. Abduwali Muse is a Somali hijacker convicted of hijacking the MV Maersk, Alabama, a container ship. In 2009, Abduwali, alongside three other men, boarded the Maersk, Alabama container ship. During the attack, Abduwali got stabbed by a sailor and taken hostage by the crew. Captain Richard Phillips, the captain on deck, suggested that they return Abduwali and give the pirates money. In return, the pirates would leave the ship safely on its lifeboat. However, before they could facilitate the release of Abduwali, the three other hijackers escaped the ship on a lifeboat using the captain as a hostage. The lifeboat eventually got intercepted by USS Bainbridge, a destroyer ship, who negotiated with the pirates to release the captain. After hours of negotiation, they agreed to release the captain in exchange for Abduwali. Once Abduwali arrived on the USS Bainbridge, the Navy SEAL shooters took down the three hijackers at the same time. Captain Phillips was rescued while Abduwaki remained the sole survivor of the attack. He was taken to the US to answer for his crimes, making him the first pirate to be tried in an American court in over a hundred years. He was also accused of attacking two international vessels in 2010. However, his sentencing took a while as there was some confusion about whether he was of legal age or not. In February 2011, Abduwali was sentenced to 33 years and nine months behind bars in a federal prison. Colin Wright. Colin Wright is a convicted sex offender who was attracted to children and did unspeakable things to them. In 2020, Colin offered teenage girls alcohol and amphetamine as he groomed them so he could have his way with them. Colin, who was called Kosh by these teenagers, made his home accessible to young girls who wanted to skip school and have a taste of hard drugs. His intention was to satisfy their cravings and exploit them for his pleasure. Kosh had been jailed for similar offenses as far back as the 1970s. He once promised a teen 50 euros to see her cleavage only to proceed to force his way with her. After the incident, he put 20 euros into an envelope and handed it over to the girl. Another teen revealed that the 61-year-old once offered her 100 euros so he could sleep with her, but she refused. Colin's lawyer claimed that he doesn't remember exactly how some of the events unfolded, but takes responsibility for his actions. She added that he was ashamed and apologetic for what he did to the schoolgirls. A jury found Colin guilty after a trial and sentenced him to 16 years behind bars. Shane Murphy 
The last prisoner on our list of the world's dangerous men held in captivity is Shane Murphy, also known as the baseball murderer. In June 2018, Murphy savagely murdered Marie Gibson, his partner, at her home in Lincolnshire with a baseball bat. By the time Murphy was done, Marie's face was unrecognizable. They also found a shard of broken glass around her neck. Before the murder, Marie placed a 999 call where the operator could hear her screaming. By the time the police arrived at her house, she was lying down on the floor lifeless with her boyfriend on the run. According to reports, the murder happened in the presence of a young child. Murphy, who denied the murder at first, later admitted to the crime, but denied responsibility, using a mental health condition as an excuse. He also told the judge that he tried to restrain Marie, who weighed just 98 pounds, when she tried to attack him with a baseball bat. He added that the bat shattered the mirror, which caused a bit of glass to break loose and get stuck in Marie's neck. The judge didn't buy the story, as it wasn't adding up. As a result, Judge John Pinney of Lincoln Crown Court sentenced Shane Murphy to life imprisonment with a mandatory sentence of 20 years after being found guilty by a jury. The real motive behind the murder remains unclear, and that's it on the world's most dangerous men held in captivity. Click on the cards showing on your screen right now for more captivating videos.